Good afternoon. Welcome to this month's installment of Creation Justice Webinars, the monthly program that puts faith into action for the sake of our common home. I am Brooks Barrett, the Environmental Justice Minister for the United Church of Christ. And I, as always, I co-host this program with the Reverend Michael Malcolm, who serves as the Executive Director for Alabama Interfaith Power and Light and the People's Justice Council. We are excited about this program today. I am a firm believer in the importance of any movement knowing its history. It, I feel a movement is severely limited if it doesn't know from which it came and lacks is as, because uh, if you don't know that history, you don't uh, know the wisdom that comes from it. And so we are particularly excited to have with us three panelists today. I'm gonna introduce our panelists as we get going here. Our panelists today are, first up, Charles Lee. Charles Lee is, is um, excuse me, is, is, was the lead organizer for the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. Lee is currently the Senior Policy Advisor for the EPA's Office of Environmental Justice. He was the lead author for the landmark Toxic Waste and Race in the United States report issued by the UCC's Commission for Racial Justice. He ultimately led the UCC's environmental justice program for 15 years. Second, we'll hear from Bernice Miller-Travis, who worked with Charles Lee on the Toxic Wastes and Race Report. She is currently the Executive Vice President of Metropolitan Group. Her distinguished career includes co-founding the highly regarded We Act for Environmental Justice in Harlem. In addition, she was the first Program Officer of Environmental Justice for the Ford Foundation and the founding director of the Environmental Justice Initiative of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Third, we'll hear from Richard Moore, who is the co-coordinator of Environmental Justice Health Alliance and the co-coordinator of Los Jardines Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Moore formerly served as the chair of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council and as the executive director of the Southwest Network for Environmental and Economic Justice. He currently serves as the co-chair for the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Before we hear from our three panelists, we wanna share a two and a half minute video clip from the summit so that we can all get a sense of what the actual event was like. And I will share that with you now. And that's what we're all about in Washington, D.C., powerizing ourselves to go back in our communities, because what this is all about is building a movement, huh? yeah. building a movement. And a movement, as a movement gets built, starts from the bottom up. And those movements that we've seen develop from the top down are no longer there. So what we're about here is building a network or building a net that works. I wanted to finish actually by just offering to you for discussion. The principles of environmental justice says we the, the people of color of the United States of America in order to form a more perfect union to reestablish our spiritual interdependence to the sacredness of the environment to ensure environmental justice to promote economic alternatives which will contribute to the development of environmentally safe jobs and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity that have been denied by over 500 years of colonization and, and oppression, which results in the poisoning of our communities and land, do affirm and adopt these principles of environmental justice. One, environmental justice demands that public policy be based on mutual respect and justice for all peoples. Okay, environmental justice calls for the universal protection from the production and disposal of poisons that threaten the fundamental right to clean air, land, water, and food. Okay? Environmental justice affirms ecological, we've been practicing that one for a while though, <laughs> ecological unity and the interdependence of all species and the right to be free from ecological destruction. 
Number 10, environmental justice mandates that the Earth's resources be used responsibly, equitably, and in the interest of, sustainable, of a sustainable planet. This is the initial draft of the principles of environmental justice. When we leave here this week, we will leave the summit with a final set of principles that we will carry, carry back home and institute in all of our communities throughout this country. This is our responsibility. The future of our communities is at stake. Venceremos, we will win. Thank you very much. We need to define in our language through our mouths what we did. And that's what we tried to do. And we tried to represent your interests. We tried to represent the things that you had to say. And I, I hope that we did justice to that. All right, there you have it. The original footage from the summit itself. I will include a link where you can see a two hour documentary full of original uh, footage from the summit. It's very inspiring. I've enjoyed watching it a few times. And now we will hear from those who were there and heavily involved as leaders in that important event. Charles Lee was indeed an important part of that event and Charles will now share with us his reflections. Go ahead, Charles. Thank you, Brooks. And, um... Uh, thank you for um, having me on this um, celebration of the 30th anniversary of the first National People Call Environmental Leadership Summit. Um, you know, I, I want to start by saying that um, I, um, I was working for the United Church of Christ um, at that point, and um, it was a real honor to work with for the UCC in that capacity and to be able to uh, play a small part uh, in, um, you know, really changing the world, I think. You know, and so um, I would start by talking about um, what I said in the uh, in the um, introduction to the proceedings of the of the summit. Uh, the first um, sentence was that um, in the eyes of many people, um, the environmental movement in the United States uh, changed forever on October 24th through 27th, 1991. And, you know, and when um, I wrote those words, I don't think I would have um, ever uh, dreamt of how uh, or conceived of how much, uh, how uh, true that is in terms of what the environmental justice movement has become um, and in terms of the kind of difference um, that the environmental justice movement has made uh, in the lives of people. So um, I, I guess uh, to reflect, um, um, you know, lessons from that, um, it was really true um, that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the summit um, sought out to redefine environmentalism. Um, and, um, you know, it, it sought to redefine environmentalism um, as a place where we, uh, uh, that was focused around, um, uh, the, the lives of people, of uh, impacted people, people who live in fence line communities um, uh, and uh, uh, reflected a broad diversity of the people that uh, were impacted. And that had to be, um, you know, what the core or the heart of the environmental movement uh, needs to, uh, that, that has to be the, the heart of the environmental movement. And, um, you know, so we define environmentalism um, as the place where we live, work, play, uh, uh, go to school, pray, um, and, uh, and, um, and um, you know, I think uh, none of us realize how profoundly important that is because, um, you know, as we um, reflect back on what environmental justice is, um, it really is about how the, um, uh, our society is spatially organized. You know, how, um, you know, where people work and play with the transportation, um, where people have access to healthcare, uh, where, where people work, you know, we can go on. And this was so uh, uh, reflective to be uh, so profoundly true for, um, you know, how, what happened during the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic in terms of how the disproportionality of, of where people end up living and working, um, having access to healthcare had an impact on why um, uh, uh, black, brown, indigenous people were so disproportionately affected uh, by, uh, by, the, uh, by the pandemic. 
So, and I think it's an organizing principle on which we uh, build towards the future in terms of uh, truly healthy and vibrant and resilient communities for all people. So that's the first thing. The second thing was that, um, uh, you know, um, you know, Dana Austin at the, um, at the summit uh, said it best, you know, we came here to speak for ourselves. So there's no, um, you know, misunderstandings about what is being said. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, the environmental justice movement has always been uh, built on this idea of, of uh, community speaking for themselves. And that, um, you know, the summit, I think, in terms of um, how we organized it, um, was meant to bring people together. Uh, and in that process, really be able to show, um, uh, like Richard said, this is empowering, um, you know, to bring and show how people of color were, in fact, um, uh, working on issues of the environment in a very um, important way, in a very significant way. And when that comes together, that can coalesce a national movement. Um, and I think, you know, um, you know the, uh, the summit had uh, two um, original um, goals, which was to, uh, to um, have uh, codify a set of principles of environmental justice. And the second was to, um, was to, um, uh, was a call for action to go back to the to communities and to organize. And, you know, over um, decades now, three decades, we've seen what that has become. And that has uh, led to, um, to um, uh, not only environmental justice, um, you know, being everywhere throughout the country, but being at the very pinnacle or the very top of the, of, uh, uh, the Biden-Harris administration's um, um, policy agenda. Um, and, you know, that's just, just something that just speaks itself, but that would not have happened if it, we didn't go back to the communities and really build a grassroots movement. Um, you know, in the little clip from Richard it says, you know, these, there's lots of movements, but the ones that have staying power are the ones that are really rooted in communities. And the third um, thing quickly is how, um, you know, we, when we brought all these people together, it really showed something that was really powerful. And it showed to each other how powerful we were uh, in terms of issues in the environment. You know, people th thought that people of color uh, didn't, uh, at that time, people of color didn't care about the environment. Well, it was because environmentalism was defined in a way that kind of, um, uh, I, that kind of excluded uh, uh, communities of color and the, you know, and the realities of, um, of those communities. And so when all these people came together, there was a real power. And I think you will hear over and over again from people who were there how, how um, what an impact I had on them and how inspirational and empowering that was. So I just end by saying that, um, that um, you know, one of my high points in the, uh, in the, um, in the um, summit was when Tom Gotooth, uh, first spoke up. And what he said at that point was that he came there uh, not knowing what, he, what to expect and not knowing if um, he should take the whole, this, this conversation seriously. Um, but, you know, as he listened uh, to everyone and heard and understood what um, people were saying and how people came together, he really, um, he said, you know, he really saw that this is a real thing um, and, um, you know, uh, and, and I think that's the spirit, you know, that um, kind of, uh, that was the, the kind of discussion, the depth of that discussion that, you know, carries through until uh, this day. So I just stopped there, uh, Brooks, in terms of some of the reflections. Thank you so much, Charles, for that reflection. And we'll turn now to Bernice. Hi, Brooks. Reverend Brooks. Um, Hello, Charles. I, I want to start uh, in a similar place to where Charles started about the significance of the United Church of Christ. Um, I had been um, on a journey that had started probably before I was 18, but I, I grew up Roman Catholic. And there was just something about the experience. I loved the social ministry of the church. But there was something about it that just did not connect with me spiritually in the way that I that I wanted to to be. 
And so I, I was exploring, you know, all kinds of different faith experiences. And when I was, I think when I was 17, um, I woke up that Easter Sunday morning, I was visiting my two aunts who happened to live a block and a half away from Riverside Church, both of them in two separate apartment buildings. And I woke up and nobody was getting ready to go to church. And I was like, well, what's going on here? And they're like, well, I said, we are not the kind of Christians that don't go to church on Easter Sunday. So you know that's a joke, right? I mean, true, but a joke. Um, and so my aunt said to me, well, if you're so fired up to go to church this morning, there's a big church right up the street. Why don't you go there? So I got my little cousin dressed. She was three at the time. And we walked on up to the church and for Easter Sunday service and sat down in the incredible sanctuary. And at the time, the senior pastor was Reverend William Sloan Coffin. And he was preaching that Easter Sunday about what would Christ do about the war in El Salvador. And I knew I had found my church. And I belonged to that church for 28 years before I moved to Maryland. But it was when I went to work with Charles and Ben Chavis and the other folks at the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice that I found the social mission that I had really been looking for mixed with my faith. And it was really doing that work with Charles and with other folks, um, Dr. Cobb, who was our, our director at the time when I, when I joined as a, as a um, research assistant to Charles, that I really found the true meaning of what I wanted my faith expression to be, which was how do you marry activism, the word, and empowering people and liberating people from a scourge that they had nothing to do with. And so all of that happened for me in doing this work. And I just wanna say that it has stayed with me forever. Um, and I've joined the church formally. I was, a, I was a member of Riverside, but I hadn't actually joined the church. And then I formally joined the church when I was working um, with Charles and Ben. But it is what I thought church should be is what we were doing with toxic waste and race and with the, the special project on toxic, just, toxic injustice and the social ministry um, that was coming out of the Commission for Racial Justice and out of the national church. So I wanna start there because that work has grounded the work that I have done for the, you know, for the, the next you know, 30 plus years it's been that that experience at at the UCC Commission for Racial Justice, and so I think it's important to say that to say that it was more than just research, right? It was more than a report. It was the answer that I had been looking for for a really long time, and who knew it was going to come forward in the form of this, you know, this incredible piece of work, toxic waste and race in the United States. So, I, so I want to say that about the UCC, um, and then the summit and the efforts of the UCC to support the First National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. And so just yesterday, um, I was going through some emails and somebody emailed Charles and I, I can't remember her name right now, but she sent Charles and I an email in the last week or so asking if we could identify the members of the Wisconsin delegation that came to attend the summit. And I didn't know where to look, but I always have the proceedings of the First National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit are always nearby my desk or somewhere in my dining room, which is my office. Um, and I went to the back of the proceedings where we have this wonderful list of the people who attended. And I said, well, let me try and go through and see, you know, who are the people who attended from Wisconsin. So I found three people. I'm only a third of the way through the attendees, but in so doing, I was able to see, and Charles, I don't think I even quite recognized this at the time, the array of people who came to the summit was quite extraordinary. And there was all kinds of people there that I didn't realize were there. Now, why didn't I realize that they were there? Because except for the first day of the summit, every day thereafter, I was um, ensconced away in a small room off the main um, the main ballroom of the Washington Court Hotel where, where we held the summit. I was in a room with a group of, I think, 
12 people, Charles, I think it was 12 of us, um, with former New Mexico Governor Tony Anaya, working through draft after draft after draft of the principles of environmental justice. So we would be in that room all day long and the conference would be going on, the summit would be going on right adjacent to us, but we were in this room working through various iterations of the principles of environmental justice. And then we would come out at night to join folks for dinner and to share with the audience what the, the latest iteration of the principles were. And then people would go through it with us word by word, line by line. We think you should put this in. We think you should take that out. We think this is appropriate. We think this is not appropriate. And finally, that Saturday night, we reached agreement um, on what what you now see as the 17 principles of environmental justice. So the other thing I loved about the summit was that process of developing the principles of environmental justice, because in my experience, it is the most demonstrative example of democratic decision making that I have ever been a part of, where 700 people came together to wordsmith something that would stand for the rest of time. Now, if you had shown another snippet of me talking at that, that particular evening, Brooks, you would see an exchange between myself and, um, and Leah, um, Leah Wise, who at the time was with the North Carolina Workers for Economic Justice, I think was the name of the organization Leah was with. And Leah got up and said, you know, I said, I think I remember saying, look, we don't have to make it perfect because we could come back and fix it, right? So it doesn't, we don't have to wordsmith every word. We can say what our values are and put that forward in the principles, but we could come back and fix it. And Leah got up and Leah said, no, we can't. This is gonna stand for all time. We are not coming back and doing this again. And I remember having this exchange with her, like Leah, sit down because we don't want to be here all night was what I was thinking, right? But she said, it has to represent what we feel and what we want to put out in the world. And so it is. But I have to just say to you that so many times I have wanted to go back and just fix the grammar, right? Um, I don't want to change the sentiment. I just want to fix the grammar. And I can't believe I didn't do it at the time while we were writing it, because that's kind of the kind of writer I am. Um, but people hold on to that that experience together. People hold on to the process of developing the principles of environmental justice. It still binds us together. So I'll, I'll just say one more thing about that. We were, I don't know, maybe this was the second day that we were working on it. And we were, we want, we were trying to write something about the, per, the particular values of indigenous sovereignty as a value statement about environmental justice, that there was something about indigenous sovereignty that was an expression of what we felt and meant in our values about environmental justice. But none of the people in the room were indigenous people, except for maybe Governor Tony Anaya. Um, but he, he was not, he was just trying to keep us moving forward. He was not trying to tell us what to write. And so Tom Golton just happened to walk by the room um, and I ran out in the hallway and I grabbed him and I said, Tom, we need your help. And he came in the room with us and we told him what we were grappling with. And he said, well, I don't know that I'm exactly the right person to help you answer that, but I know who it, he is, who is. And so he left the room. He came back five minutes later with a woman named Mililani Trask. Mililani is an incredible attorney and in, an Hawaiian indigenous leader from Hawaii. Um, she's also a UN rapporteur human rights rapporteur and Mililani sat down and wrote that principle that you see in the 17 principles about indigenous land rights and sovereignty. She wrote that in about, oh, I don't know, two minutes. And then she said, okay, this is what we need to say. And then she walked out. Um, it was that kind of experience where we trusted each other. We built a social movement. I don't know that we knew that it would have the kind of longevity that it has had but we knew that we were on this path together and that whatever we did, we were all gonna stand together. And, and that's what I remember, some of the things that I remember the, the strongest about my experience of being at the summit and, and being a part of the drafting committee that wrote the principles of environmental justice. 
Thank you, Vernice, for that, that powerful reflection. We will uh, now turn things over to Richard. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, as Reverend Brooks said, I'm Richard Moore. I'm, I'm uh, participating on this Zoom. Um, I'm calling in from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, I, I just wanted to go back. It's an honor, it's an honor, it's an honor to not only be with the United Church of Christ today and others uh, that have joined this, uh, but with the, the, the previous panels that spoke with Charles and with, and with Bernice. I just need to go back in history just for a second or two here um, in, terms of, in terms of myself and our experiences here uh, within Los Arenas Institute, the Gardens Institute, which is a citywide, statewide environmental justice grassroots organization here. Um, one, I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting and consistently reflecting on the fact that for many of us um, within our grassroots communities, uh, that, uh, that in those early days, uh, we were working on various, various, various issues. Huh? Um, and some of those would be around, uh, for example, uh, uh, chemical storage facilities that were located in our communities, um, sewage facilities, unregulated sewage facilities that were located in, also in our communities, uh, dog food companies, um, as I said, petrochemical facilities, um, landfills, uh, slaughterhouses, um, chicken farms, uh, hog farms. Um, we could go on and on and on with the various issues uh, that many of us were working on uh, previous to the first People of Color Summit. Um, I also would say uh, again quickly that, uh, that, that many of us have known each other uh, throughout the years previous to the first People of Color Summit. Uh, we were working on immigration issues, housing issues, unemployment issues, child care, health care um, in the Southwest, land issues, uh, resource issues, and so on. That's very, very crucial uh, for us to understand as we, as we talk about the First People of Color Summit. Um, the additional thing that needs to be said is that, uh, that for years and years and years, uh, previous to the First People of Color Summit, uh, we worked with various denominations, um, the United Church of Christ being one of those, um, but also with Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Baptists, um, Catholics, um, and so on. Uh, those denominations that once we were beginning to, to make the relation or correlation between civil rights and environmental justice um, and economic justice, uh, then we began in somewhat to, to bond uh, with each other and move forward and gain support and moment, momentum for many of our grassroots issues. I have to state that um, it's very, very important in terms of the history of environmental and economic justice uh, that the churches uh, were uh, on board way before foundations came on board and many other institutions. That's very, very important to us. Um, I think leading that up, uh, I remember I remember sitting in a Unitarian church here in Albuquerque uh, after the report uh, was released, uh, Toxic Race um, and so on, when the report was released. And I remember Charles, uh, I'm a lot uh, older than a lot of the folks that, uh, that are on this panel today, uh, but, uh, but I remember Charles, I remember Charles and several other sisters coming in to Albuquerque um, and speaking, and we were contacted by the Unitarian Church, uh, said, you know, there's, there's some speakers coming in. Um, and, uh, and we think the issues that you are working on is crucial to the presentation that they will give. And I remember Gene Gownam, myself, and many others in the Southwest Organizing Project in those days, uh, sitting in the room. And then, then this, uh, with, with the slide presentation, there wasn't that PowerPoints and cell phones and all these kind of things. I remember... <laughs> Uh, the slide presentation that was being given, and we were all looking at each other across the room saying, uh, when the word environmental racism was used, um, well, that's us. Uh, we've been working on social justice issues, racial justice issues, human rights issues, um, and here we are today, and we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about environmental and economic injustice and the intersections between those. Um, and so that's the first, uh, the first time, I think, Charles, uh, if I'm correct, that, uh, that we met, that, that visit was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, during that presentation. Um, and this kind of lifting it up, I just want to very quickly go back again to, to one very significant thing when it comes to Richard. Richard has never done anything by himself. He's always done it with other people. 
um, and, 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 and we continue that in Los Adinas Institute and the other organizations that I'm a part, about, a part of. It's not about Richard, it's about the 500 and more years now of oppression that our people have been living under systemic racism and all the pieces that are connected, policies and others that are connected to systemic racism. Lastly, and I'm gonna go into some lessons learned. Uh, I remember as a youngster here, uh, living at San Felipe Church, uh, the Catholic church that's located in Old Town here. And uh, the pastor of that church, uh, Father Luis Aramil, was a liberation theologist. Um, and, uh, and, and him and I would have constant discussions uh, about, about religion, about social justice, racial justice, and so on. Um, right around that earlier time of the moments in the 1960s uh, is when Reverend King, Reverend King, Martin Luther King was assassinated. He had already called uh, through uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, for the national mobilization of the Poor People's Campaign to Washington, D.C. Part of the reason why I'm flagging that as young people uh, during that time and a inter, very inter, 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 intergenerational delegation uh, that left New Mexico uh, and, and, took, and took that caravan on to Washington, D.C. to meet with our sisters and brothers. Um, when we returned back to New Mexico, the elders called us into a small rural uh, village in Northern New Mexico, and they said, young sisters and brothers, you all are doing incredible things. You founded the first health clinic, community run health clinic, the first dental clinic, a wood cooperative, um, cultural schools, um, liberation schools, um, breakfast and lunch programs. And I say that because three and a half days later, um, when we sat around that bonfire at night, singing, crying, hearing stories, listening to music, talking history and culture, those elders ask us to never forget three things. And I just wanna go through those and go into lessons learned. One of the, one of the questions that they, they asked us, was this just a tourist trip that you all took to Washington DC? They knew the answer to that. Um, and they said, look, you need to make a commitment to the experiences, your culture and your history for the rest of your life. And so as we, as we end this convening uh, today and we celebrate together uh, in the mountains of Northern New Mexico, they said, one, sisters and brothers, never forget where you come from or where you came from. Two, always remember whose shoulders that you stand on. And number three, always give back to others what's been given to you. And that's the principles uh, that Los Adinans Institute and many of us in grassroots communities are still operating under today. Those three, what I'll call principles. Previous to the First People of Color Summit, there's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of organizations, grassroots organizations working throughout the country on various military issues and so on, military contamination. Um, and so based upon that, that's a piece of our history. Uh, coming up very quickly to the First People of Color Summit, I think many may, may be aware that the First People of Color Summit was originally scheduled to take place in 1990 and actually took place in 1991. I think this bottom-up process that we're talking about in our engagement uh, with Ben um, and, 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 and the steering committee, which later became the planning committee of the First People of Color Summit, that we needed to, the opportunity and the moment to practice what we all preach. And that's the bottom up process, no? Um, and that's the short version of 1990 to 1991. We set out in that time period and we interacted with groups that were members of coalitions, networks and alliances, and those grassroots groups that were not. And so that took place all over the country, broke down into various regions that also then moved us into the first people of color summit. That's very, very crucial to me. The bottom up process is very, very crucial and we need to continue that. So lessons learned, uh, absolutely incredible process. What can I say? As Bernice said, 700 people, um, which later became over a thousand people because many people know if you look at that two hour uh, piece that was spoken to earlier, that you'll see in there uh, that the first initial stage of the first people of color summit um, came together as people of color, as native indigenous, as uh, as, as people of color, African-Americans, Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, and Latinos. Um, incredible, incredible process. And then there was a second piece that went along with that, uh, was when we opened up to have some other allies and others participate 
um, in, the, in, in a piece of the First People of Color Summit. And there's clips of that in that video. Lessons learned, uh, one very clearly agreeing with our panelists uh, that, uh, that, the, that the principles of environmental justice were very, very crucial to this. But I just wanna lift up a couple of other things that were very, very crucial. Uh, governments and other institutions uh, throughout these many, many years have pitted us against each other as people of color and native indigenous people intentionally in some cases or unintentionally um, over urban removal or urban renewal. I mean, you can go on and on and on with issues that, that, that was pitting us against each other. One of the primary pieces to me um, that's still crucial today is that as people of color, we came together and we made agreements together. We made agreements to, to be autonomous um, as from, very, from various of our ethnic groups that were represented there, not just in this country, but other parts of the country throughout the world that participated. And we bonded at that particular point. And we said, and when we left the first people of color summit that we will not allow a government, whether it's city, county, state, or federal government, or any other institution to pit us against each other. That's very, very crucial coming out of the first people of color summit. So with that, just, uh, just as I said, uh, dancing, singing, celebrating, crying, um, bonding and moving forward to build the necessary kind of movement uh, that's still as necessary as it was then during this time period. So lessons learned for me, always, always make sure that the, that the bottom up process is intact. Um, and so when we pull those pieces together, um, because then there's several other significant pieces that we're, we're very aware of. One was the principles of the environmental justice. The other was the theme or the concept that we speak for ourselves. I think additional one coming out of the second People of Color Summit was the principles of working together. And then also along with that coming further into it was the, the Hemis principles for democratic organizing. Uh, so thank you, Reverend Brooks. Thank you, sisters and brothers. Uh, thank you, panelists. Uh, and I'm looking forward to continuing to work with the United Church of Christ throughout this period of time. And we thank you all uh, for the utmost, utmost and our children here at Los Sardinas, our youth, our adults, and our elders send greetings from the beautiful state of New Mexico. Thank you very much, Reverend. Thank you, Richard. I'm gonna turn things over to my co-host, Michael Malcolm, who is with us and he'll get us kick-started on our question and answer period. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, let me say, I am coming to you all live from the White House right now, I'm literally Sitting outside the White House, we have had people being locked up uh, all week long. At this point, we're over 300 people that have um, gotten arrested uh, in protest to let uh, Biden know and the administration know that we need to build back better and with equity and justice. Uh, and, and to say that is to say thank you to uh, Richard as well as Charles and especially big sister uh, Vernice. I appreciate you all and what you did in paving the way. Let me ask you a question, uh, and any one of you all can answer this. As far as the church was concerned, in particular the United Church of Christ, um, but other congregations as well, how receptive that were they to your work? Uh, and, and did they actually see the benefit um, after, it, after it was produced? Oh, I would first. say, well, Bernice, you want to go first? No, you go first. No, you go first. Well, you know, um, you know, uh, I think it's been uh, said by all of us, the uh, United Church of Christ played a huge role, um, you know, in the um, emergence of the environmental justice movement. Um, you know, at that time, when we started doing that work, um, there was, uh, you know, people thought that uh, communities of color didn't care about issues of the environment, but, you know, I think that, you know, we kind of, I think we really changed that. Um, and, um, and um, you know, it was really great that the United Church of Christ didn't do it as the United Church of Christ, but as the, um, as the body that helped, um, you know, support uh, the emergence of, um, and the voices of uh, communities coming together. You know, so that it was really uh, something where the um, community spoke for themselves, and um, and 
and, and provided the leadership in terms of what the issues were and what the content and what the program or what the agenda was. Um, and, um, and we played a role that um, was um, a kind of support that process coming together. And like Richard said, you know, um, it took a long time. It took a lot of different layers of people. I, I think we had not just a steering committee or a planning committee. We had an advisory committee that was a hundred people uh, in numbers. And, you know, and it, it, it didn't start out with so many people uh, being part of that process. But over that time, all these people uh, came together and we got to know and the, um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the amount of work that was going on on these issues. So, you know, the, the, and part of that process, uh, like you were asking about other, 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 um, other um, uh, uh, denominations and other, um, um, you know, they were all part of that process. Uh, and um, and, um, uh, and I, I, I will say that, you know, they were part of it um, as one, you know, they were real um, important uh, partners in that process, but also that, um, you know, this whole idea that, um, I mean, this didn't just come from the United Church of Christ, this came from the Commission for Racial Justice, that it has to be something that was led by people of color, um, you know, was something that I think was a new idea uh, at that time. As I, I, I would just offer, as I was, as I mentioned in my opening comments, looking through the participants list of um, folks who were at the summit, virtually every denomination was there. Virtually every denomination, every Protestant denomination was, um, had sent representatives and some folks sent a lot of folks. And I was really, um, I was really taken aback by that about how many people were there, right? So Presbyterian Church USA, um, Unitarian Universalist, United Methodist, United Methodist Women's Division, um, Baptist Progressive um, Convention, um, everybody, everybody was there. Um, and I, I remember thinking yesterday, boy, Charles must have been an organizing fool because the whole um, representation of the, you know, of the, the religious community was present. And so I, I, I felt, and Charles, you, you would know, I felt that maybe there had been some special outreach that had been done by the UCC to get folks there, but they were present in the room. Um, and you could see that work going forward after the summit. You could especially see it in the, in my opinion, in the Presbyterians, um, and in the United Methodists, that they really, really moved forward an agenda. Um, there were also a few people there from Geneva, from the World Council of Churches. The National Council of Churches was present. I mean, you know, everybody was there together. And then folks, just like we went back home and organized, they went back and organized within their churches. Not everyone stepped up to the same degree, but I particularly remember the Presbyterian Church USA the National Council of Churches and United Methodist Church going above and beyond to, to drill down in their own denominations what environmental justice meant for them in the context of their church and of their members and of their congregants. Well, Big Sister Bernice uh, and, and Rev, I hope you don't mind me following up. Uh, I did leave a, a note in the chat that I wanted to follow up with this. Um, I. Honestly, Brother Richard, uh, Brother Charles, I am wondering what has happened because the the same fire and the same mantle that we carried before, it seems as if though um, it has now gone to more secular organizations, one that carry this, this uh, fight. Uh, but even in the congregations, we don't really engage in it uh, as wholeheartedly as we saw um, with you all. And, and so I'm wondering what has happened? What has happened to us as congregations? What has happened to bodies of believers? What has happened to uh, us in, in faith? 
period, that we don't continue to hold this as a as a movement for us and see it as sacred and holy. Well, I just will add, uh, Reverend Malcolm, and, 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 and thank you for that. Um, and that's going to take a much deeper discussion. You know that. And we're going to continue to have that discussion. But, uh, but I, will, I, I will flag, if we look back uh, during that time period, uh, then we'll see that the, the National Council of Churches was actually very, very strong. Um, and the World Council of Churches at that particular point were very, very strong. And so in the strength of that, so were many of the denominations. But my earlier comment uh, was making that connection uh, between civil rights and environmental and economic justice, um, that environmental and economic justice is civil rights, um, and civil rights is environmental and economic justice, social justice, racial justice, all those other issues. And if we just quickly, if we, if we just think back, the right took over the National Council of Churches. And in that process, uh, then we saw, um, 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 even coming into the 70s and 80s, uh, we saw to, they, stripped, they stripped out uh, much of the work. The right, right came in, took it over, uh, ran, ran a, what I'll say, a very successful campaign. Um, and so, so, so there's a lot of work. I mean, one, we need to remember the history, but then also uh, we need to make sure that we're re-engaging in that process. Uh, I know I didn't give a direct answer, answer Reverend Malcolm, but uh, but but everyone knows that any of us on this on this uh, on this screen could go into this much deeper. I, um, Reverend Michael, let me say that there's one person in particular, I think, whose presence, whose death, um, and that would be Dr. Jean Sindab, right. the National Council of Churches. Jean was really moving the National Council of Churches in a different direction. Um, she had come out of the World Council of Churches in Geneva, the program to combat racism. She brought that frame to her work at the National Council of Churches. And Jean died of breast cancer in early 1996. And I wanna say the loss of Jean was a particular blow to our community but also to building that bridge with the faith community and pushing the faith community to go deeper. Um, one of the things that Jean helped to do was to establish the Religious Partnership for the Environment, which did some really early, really good work, particularly around bringing, um, bringing um, uh, the Christian right congregations into a partnership on some issues, not on all issues, but on some issues, but there was, work going on. And I think the loss of Gene was really a huge blow to moving this agenda within the, the faith community. That's my personal thought. Richard, I don't, I don't know where you and, and Charles stand on that, but that's, that's something that I felt very deeply. Charles, do you, you have a comment, Charles? Yeah, I was going to mention Jean. Um, I mean, I think she was a a, a real uh, force in uh, bringing these issues. Um, and, um, you know, and uh, her loss was really, really, um, really tragic. And again, that's a piece of that history that we're talking about. We need to go back. Uh, one of the things that came out of that um, uh, with Jean's work was the Echo Justice Working Group of the National Council of Churches. And there was a deliberate uh, decision. I mean, at one point, I co-chaired the Echo Justice Working Group back during that time um, with, uh, with the United Methodist, with J.D. Hansen uh, yes. from the United Methodist Church. Uh, yes. But again, that's, that, that Echo Justice Working Group um, was an example of just one, I think, of the many things uh, that the denominations came together uh, to be able to form. So I'll leave it there, Reverend. I have a, a question kind of inspired by your final comments, Richard, about how the summit was originally planned from 1990. And to me, it made me think of what I think is a striking contrast between now and then maybe, it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but to me, it seems like today there's a, on the one hand, there's often a kind of a get rich quick version of, of a mobilizing right, where you want something to go viral fast. And that, you know, is like getting something on social media or getting a good video clip, making it viral and things will just take off and get going. Forgetting that, you know, a lot of these things that 
that were so profound took a lot, some time and some organizing. And it wasn't just making a social media thing. You know, and at the same time, I also think there's a time pressure today, the sense that we've only got, you know, nine years or we've only got so many years before things go out of control with the climate crisis. And, and I think that, I don't know, does that take away some of the patients, right? And so I, so my question is, is what's the, how would you best make a case for maybe the slow work of organizing in today's con, today's context or, you know, or if you would put it that way. You are mute, well, Richard. Thank you, Miss. Um, very, very quickly. Um, I think one is, is, is Reverend, uh, Reverend Brooks, um, exactly what you're flagging there. Um, I think uh, I think the dependency on technology. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna just flag that. Um, in those days, we spent a lot of time on the streets. Um, I mean, door knocking is what I'm talking about, engaging with our community members and next door neighbors and this kind of thing. I'm not making a criticism, as we say to our youth here, use the technology to the utmost, but never forget the same. The primary source of communication is that verbal, that face to face communications. Um, and engaging with our people, I think it's the same way with the church. I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually say that I had to make. I'm, I'm a Catholic for those that don't know it. Um, I remember at one point uh, the Archbishop calling me in uh, to his office and saying, "Hey, Richard, um, do you want to do you want to join the United Church of Christ? I mean, you want to be a Methodist? Or, or, what, what do you want to be? You're spending more time with with those folk as you're than you're spending with us." And I said, "With all respect, Archbishop." You need to get up off of it. I'm going to be straight up now because you and I can be straight up with each other. Um, and then and then the church must must engage in a much deeper way. And so so I think that's I think that's one of one of those things. And, and I, I just want to add to that. We've come a long ways. Uh, and I know that um, I know even with this administration and the commitment that this administration has made um, that, uh, that, that our people are, 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 are getting tired and a little frustrated at this particular point. No? Uh, we understand the world conditions and all of that. Um, but, but I want to say there, as I go back and I just say that to the church, we'll be hosting here um, in the next couple uh, weeks uh, uh, several nuns that were coming. If you look at the Catholic Church, there was Padres, no? uh, and the nuns had their own organization. Um, and this kind of thing, but a lot of real kind of engagement that was taking place there, uh, engagement uh, with the congregation, but in, in, in engagement with others at the same time, that's, that's to me, is just not happening at the level, and I understand the virus, and, it, and we can't blame everything on the virus, because part of what we're talking about right now was taking place before we got slammed with this virus, so I'm just going to kind of leave it there and, and, and open it up to Vernice and, and to Charles. I, I, I was going to say exactly what Richard has said. Um, I think there's too much dependency on technology as a form of organizing. Technology is a tool, but it's not organizing, right? Organizing is what you do when you go outside and you meet up with your people and you go door to door. You go to the courthouse door. You go wherever you're going to go to petition. While we were at the summit, um, Richard and Tom and a whole bunch of other people led a demonstration to where did we go, Richard? Was it the Supreme Court? Where did we go? We did the Supreme Court, but we went in, uh, we went over to the White House where Reverend, where Reverend Malcolm is um, at one so, point on the steps. And we wanted we wanted people to know right in the middle of the summit that the way that we would achieve a lot of the things that we were envisioning at that moment was by moving together, mobilizing, mass mobilization, right? So, and then we taught, we, we, we tasked ourselves coming out of the summit to go back home into our communities and to organize our people, right? We did that in West Harlem. Um, Richard did that with the Southwest Organizing Project and then the Southwest Net Network for Economic and Environmental Justice. The United Church of Christ did that through its member churches. The churches were out in the street. Right. It was the, the members, the congregants of the United Church of Christ that brought this conversation to the national four. It was their mobilization. So I, I you know, I'm right where Richard is. I think we are so dependent on technology. And this was happening long before um, the covid moment that we have forgotten how to or maybe some of us don't know how to 
mobilize in the streets, but we have to do all of that. We have to do the technology. We have to do the mobilization. We have to build community. We have to be engaged with church. We have to do all of that to build social movement. It cannot just be an electronic movement. Yeah, I only want to add that, um, you know, um, when we uh, put together the summit, we knew that um, it was really, it, no matter what it was, it was going to be historic. So I think, um, you know, taking the time to uh, do it right, um, you know, that uh, a lot of the work in organizing this wasn't from, um, you know, an office in New York or anything like that. It was the, all, the, all the engagement that was done with people uh, that build up momentum over time. And then, you know, we were ready to bring everybody together. And, and to that end, we should lift up another name, um, Brother Damu Smith, um, who was based here, uh, here, I say here, I'm in, I'm in the DMV in the DC, Maryland, Virginia. Damu lived in DC, but he was organizing on behalf of the United Church of Christ, taking this conversation to communities everywhere. And then all those folks showed up at the summit. It, it wasn't just because we sent out an email because we didn't have email at the time, right? This is before email. This is before cell phones. This is before text messages. We had to get out there and mobilize people. And, and um, Charles and, and Ben brought Damu on to help organize to bring people to the summit. So it, it was a lot of work. And a lot of that work was grassroots organizing and mobilization. Damu yeah. died in, in 2005. The other thing was um, that made it work, and you know, it continues to be a big issue today. Our resources, you know, it took a lot of resources um, to uh, support people, um, and um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars just to bring people to uh, to to the summit. And if that were available, uh, then um, you know, it wouldn't happen the way it did. And so, you know. I think this was an issue that was, um, you know, that people knew about back then. It continues to be an issue, um, you know, um, and um, uh, and we have to recognize, you know, that the 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 thing that's stopping a lot of the good work that's going on are resources for those communities. Thank you so much. This is, uh, I wish we could stay for another hour having this good conversation. But um, we will we will turn things, uh, we will now kind of transition to the action portion of our, of our webinar. Michael, before we bring Roberto Rominger on to lead us in an action focused on what's going on in Congress right now, do you have any final words or wrap up words of summation for us? Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for um, the guests that we've had, uh, Richard and Charles and, and Bernice. Thank you for imparting with us the history of uh, the uh, summit, as well as the principles of democratic organizing. And uh, I want to say that this history and these principles mean nothing unless they are applied. Unless they are applied, they mean absolutely nothing. The reason why I asked the question earlier, what has happened, is, is I actually asked the loaded question, Mr. Richard, and I'll say what has happened is we've forgotten that we have to apply the principles. It's not enough to read them. It's not enough to read the history and know the history. If we don't use it, if we don't apply it, if we don't allow it to continue to govern us, then we've done nothing. And the history does die and the principles die. They live on paper, but not in our hearts. So I challenge each and every one of us to not only learn these principles, not only know this history, but also allow it to you to instill in your heart so it can motivate you to action. I'll be honest with you all, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly disappointed that we don't have more faith leaders out here at the White House urging our, our governmental institution to see about people. I, I'm, I'm discouraged when I look and I see that there aren't as many faith leaders that are compelled to do this work time and time again, when it's our job as ambassadors for care to be speaking up in these moments and fighting for the right to breathe clean air and to live in a habitable planet and have 
uh, food sources, healthy food sources, and clean water. It's, these are things that are incumbent upon us to live. And we should be the first ones as communities of faith out here fighting for it. I, I challenge each and every one of you all to start calling your governors and calling your legislators, your senators, your representatives, and encouraging them. Uh, no, not even encouraging them, demanding from them in the name of your faith, demanding that they do better about planet and people and us moving together collectively with those who are fighting. Listen, I, I you see, I've got my clergy, my clergy hat on because I show up at these movements to show people that God is there and present in the midst of this and encourage them to continue to fight. And I act as a chaplain in this moment because it's very much needed. It's very much needed. Now, I'm not the only one that, that's a chaplain. I'm not the only one that's a reverend. I'm not the only one that's a faith leader that's on this call or the ones that may review the recording. Get involved. And Sister Vanessa said, go deeper. Go deeper. I challenge each and every one of us to go deeper. Let's, let's look at our extractive relationships and start making those extractive relationships, regenerative relationships. And I'm just not talking about with people, but I'm talking about with our non-human neighbors and our non-human relatives as well. And if you're doing that, then you're caring for creation and you're doing justice, which is what we, we're here to do. Thank you. Thank you for those words, Michael. And thank you to our three panelists for embodying the highest and best of our values and principles and embodying the spirit of justice and all that you do. We are so grateful to you. Um, we are glad to now have this resource that will live on for people to view and to learn from. Please stick on uh, our audience members. We invite you to stay on because really now is a all hands on deck moment for the climate justice movement, uh, for the justice movement broadly speaking. We've been talking about how we need to get something through in Congress for years and now we've got a window of opportunity. Now's our moment. Now's our, our time to, to act. And so uh, we're now gonna turn things over to Roberta Rominger. Uh, Roberta, tell us what's going on and, and what we can do. Yeah, thank you, Brooks, with pleasure. And Michael, if you could stick around for a bit, uh, that would be wonderful because you're gonna have more information to feed into this discussion. Um, if you've heard it all on the news about this reconciliation bill, Build Back Better, probably what you've heard is that they're fussing about it in the Senate, especially um, because um, the Republican Party for sure, but some of our less progressive Democrats as well are saying this thing is too expensive. This, this bill cannot be passed in its form because it's, we can't spend that kind of money, $3.5 trillion over the 10 years. Um, and when they start talking like that and they're around the negotiating table, they start chopping things out of the bill to make it cheaper. And our fear is that what they're gonna chop is the climate provisions and right on the heels of that, um, all the, the excellent uh, provision to make our country a more equitable place to live, which has you know, been our dream and our passion um, for our whole lives probably. Um, so I got a link for you. Um, this is the easy way to do it. If you go to this web page, um, our friends in Washington DC have helped us, our, our, uh, our UCC team that works there on the steps of the Capitol. Um, a form of words, this is an automated email. You just have to, to put in your zip code, your, um, your address and push the button. And this will be a message that goes to your senators, your member of Congress in order to demand that the, that the climate measures not be deleted from the Build Back Better bill. Um, they, are, they also have pro provided for us a larger toolkit. So not just about the climate issue, but also about all the other provisions of the bill, the education, the healthcare and so forth. Um, and I can put that link also. Um, if you wanna do the urgent action today, it's just click the link I've given you, send off that email to your senators and your member of Congress. But if you've got more time to dig into this, and I'm really feeling challenged to that by our speakers today, 
um, have a read of the longer toolkit because it gives you ways, gives you lots of things that you can post on social media, on Twitter and Facebook. It gives you uh, more issues that you can raise and ways of doing that. So let me put that one as well. Um, Michael, anything to add to that or Brooks? I, th I think this is great, Roberta. Thank you so much for doing this. And, you know, I'll just add, you know, always thinking of ways that we can do uh, more to make the most of this moment. Uh, as we say in the Christian faith, this is a Kairos moment. It's a, it might be a time of crisis, but it's also a time of opportunity. And, yeah. and I really feel that that's the case here. If you're in the D.C. area, go, go join Michael. Um, but if you can't make it to the D.C. area, you know, I'm a part of a local group in, in Cleveland that's getting together by Zoom tomorrow to plan a vigil for our senators to do outside of our senator's office right here in Cleveland. You know, look Excellent. to do those local actions, too. And don't just assume that because your uh, your elected representative is a part of one party or other, they're just going to act one way, because right now they're they're making they're having those backroom conversations aside oh, should we cut this or that? You know, and so don't, don't assume that you're, whoever it is, Republican or Democrat is going to act, you know, you're just certain they're going to act one way. You know, if you, if you get out and do something, you're, you're, you're putting the, you know, you're, you're not just throwing in the cards. You're saying, I'm going to give it everything I've got um, to see that this turns out right. So Michael, any words? Yeah, let, let me say this uh, from a strategic point of view. Uh, what we're really trying to do is put as much uh, pressure on our progressives so that we don't have the uh, bipartisan infrastructure framework uh, without having to build back better. If we have the bipartisan infrastructure framework, it is not a climate solution nor a solution for any justice period. All it is is more money to the status quo, which is oftentimes fossil fuel that continue, continues to kill and continue, continues to kill our communities in a very literal sense. Um, I, I heard earlier today that someone said uh, our climate crisis and what will happen in the future, but the reality is that our communities are suffering now. And, and the reason that they're suffering now is because they have industry that has moved in in their communities and, is, uh, and are literally poisoning them. And, and it's up for us to do something about it. You may not want to come and get locked up like I'm willing to do or, or like Brooks is willing to do or Jim is willing to do. And that's well and fine. I understand if you have that reservation. However, it's not something or uh, they won't lock you up for picking up a telephone and calling your local official or your, your statewide officials to say, hey, we want to make sure that you are looking out for planet and people, so we need to build back better uh, bill passed in its whole, in its whole. Understand that some of the things that are in the bill back better are actually there to combat the uh, bipartisan infrastructure framework, because the truth of the matter is they backed themselves in the corner, and now they're just trying to figure out how to get out of it. Uh, so we need all or nothing. We need all or nothing. And you need to let your people know to hold the line, all or nothing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And when you talk about the Kairos moment, it uh, seems to me not only is, is our, our nation at this absolutely crucial juncture, um, but the world is as well. And uh, before we close, I'd like to put in a plug. Uh, if you could get all your congregations praying for the COP26 conference that's going to be taking place in Glasgow starting on the 31st of October. So that will be before, I think the whole thing will happen before our next webinar session together. Um, if you watch uh, for an email from Brooks, the follow-up email to this webinar, it will contain some prayer resources that your congregation can use. Uh, but everybody needs to be aware of that one as well. This is, wow, such a time. Everything coming together. Thank you, Roberta, for pulling that together. And, um, and we'll, Michael and I are working to pull it together. Our next webinar, which will focus on COP26, uh, will be uh, right in the midst of it during our oh, next great. webinar. So we're, 
we're working on that for, uh, I believe it's November 10th, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, same time and place uh, ne next month. So thanks, thank you, uh, Roberta, for getting us organized and active. Always appreciated. And thank you, Michael, for being there uh, in, in Washington, D.C., you know, advocating uh, on our behalf and on behalf of on behalf of justice. And so uh, we're grateful and we want to do what we can to support you and to support the larger movement. So thanks everybody. We uh, look forward to, to being back together a month from now. Take care.